Hi, and welcome everybody to today's webinar on the topic of navigating ethically challenging scenarios. This is going to be a very fascinating webinar, but before we introduce the speakers, I have a couple of housekeeping items to go over. For those of you who have never participated in these webinars before and may not be familiar with our platform, um, we do record this webinar, so we do not open the lines to all the participants. So if you have questions for the speakers at any time throughout the presentation, you can submit your questions, but we will hold them till the end. So we will post them at the end of the presentation. To submit your questions, on the bottom left-hand corner, you will see a chat icon. Just click on that icon and submit your questions that way. I also wanted to announce that coming up next week on September 19th is our next innovation webinar. We hold three of these a year, and this one is on the topic of lung technologies and impact on lung recovery practices, and you can register for that on the organdonationalliance.org website under education. Also coming up on September 26th is our next transplant webinar on the topic of pairing the kidney selection and management for dual transplants. Registration is open for that as well. And then coming up as well on October 19th, we have our annual Brain Death Declaration webinar for nursing, a nursing perspective. Uh, this year we do have a new presenter who's going to be presenting this webinar, so we encourage you to register for this as well by going to the organdonationalliance.org website and going under education. For today's webinar, we are offering one SEPC credit as well as 1.2 nursing contact hours courtesy of Iowa Donor Network. Everybody who's listening to today's webinar is entitled to uh, receiving a certificate of attendance or one of these continuing education credits. All you have to do is complete the evaluation process. So for those of you who are listening in a group, whoever registered for the group will be the one that will receive the link for the web for the evaluation. So um, if you're leading a group, please make sure to forward that link to the whole group. Or if you're in a group and did not receive that link, please reach out to the person who set you up for this webinar today and ask them for the link so that you can complete um, the evaluation. So that should be coming out within 24 hours from this webinar. At this point, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar. Our moderator is Dustin Wright. He kindly organized this webinar and our speakers. He's a member of our Get Connected webinar faculty, and he's also a hospital services liaison at the Nevada Donor Network. So I'm going to turn it to Dustin to introduce our speakers. Thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Haiti. As she said, my name is Dustin Wright, and I'm reporting out from the fabulous Las Vegas. Before we get started, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our three speakers, Dr. Ronnie. Kesa Vulu, Kristen Wilcox, and Ronaldo Ray Orozco. Dr. Vatala Rani Kesa Vulu received her BA from Texas A&M University College Station and her MD from the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. She followed this with an internship in pediatrics at University Hospital and Santa Rosa Children's Hospital, the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. She then completed a residency in pediatrics at the same facility before becoming a fellow in pediatric critical care medicine at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. She has worked at David Geffen School of Medicine, UCLA Medical Center in Los Angeles, California for the Children's Healthcare Network, and is currently with Pediatric Medical Group with hospital affiliations in both California and Nevada. She has been on numerous committees and held academic appointments at facilities such as University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine, University of Texas Health Science Center, and of course UCLA Medical Center. Dr. Kesavulu has authored and co-authored numerous peer-reviewed research papers and presented around the world on pediatric critical care. Our next speaker is Kristen Wilcox. She was born in Texas and raised in Arizona where she attended her first years of schooling at the University of Arizona. Kristen moved to Las Vegas to be closer to family in 2006 and received her Bachelor of Science in Nursing from the University of Nevada, Las Vegas in 2008. Prior to joining Nevada Donor Network, Kristen worked for several years in critical care at Valley Hospital Medical Center with a focus on cardiovascular and neurosurgical care. Kristen holds certification as a critical care nurse. She joined Nevada Donor Network in May 2016 
as a Valley Health System in-house clinical coordinator, where she covers five Valley Health System hospitals. In her spare time, she enjoys traveling with her husband and two children, playing in the outdoors, and reading. And last but certainly not least is Ronaldo Ray Orozco. Ronaldo has 17 years of experience in the donation world, starting his career as a tissue referral responder, family advocate in Texas, working his way into the role of family services manager, assisting families in hospitals in the Coast Bend area. Shortly thereafter, he accepted a position with the OPO in Texas as a regional client services coordinator family advocate, where he continued the mission of improving and saving lives for the next 10 years. Ronaldo has also worked for the University of Miami, and for the last four years, he has been with Nevada Donor Network in his role as a referral responder, family services coordinator. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kate Zavulu. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to first start off by thanking uh, Heidi Aguilar and the Alliance for giving us the opportunity to speak today. Uh, and also extend my gratitude to Justin Wright for bring, putting together this um, nice uh, working group and my co hosts Kristen and Ronaldo, for, their, for such a great collaborative team. So what we're going to talk about today is donation after circulatory determination of death. This is a subject that is fraught with emotional and ethical pitfalls. Our hope is that we can demonstrate that a, how a thoughtful, collaborative approach can navigate some of these difficult subjects and that you have a better working understanding by the end of this talk. First off, transplantation, as we well know, has become a definitive solution for more and more conditions. And these conditions extend even into the neonatal period of the first month of life. Um, so as medicine has improved, we've had more people surviving, and it has created greater demand. Children make up a very small percentage of this overall uh, group of patients that are awaiting transplant. However, they carry a much higher uh, mortality and morbidity. So, um, as you can see, and as you're well aware, we have about 120,000 transplants. Uh, sorry, patients awaiting transplants per year. And, and now we're averaging about 10,000 donors per year, which gives us approximately 30,000 transplanted organs. Um, in the small subset of pediatric patients, um, as we talked about, um, there's a much higher uh, morbidity and mortality associated with this. So if you look at one study by Colvin Adams in the American Journal of Transplantation from 2015, they looked at all pediatric heart transplants, uh, patients awaiting a, a heart. And if you were less than a year of age, your mortality rate was five times that of patients in the one to five year age group, which is also higher than in the adult population. So there have been efforts to maximize transplantable organs. These include the U.S. government mandating that uh, potential donors be referred to OPOs in a timely manner, that we have trained OPO staff that are meant to address, that have the uh, dedication and training to be able to approach families in a kind and caring way during this most difficult time, and that we are trying to accept more uh, potential donors in the DCDD category and that we're trying to expand this push to, uh, to more and more patients, uh, including neonates that are born with very lethal conditions such as anencephaly. Uh, so there is a small population of patients that are living donors, but most, the majority of uh, our donors come from the category of donors that have passed. And so there's some foundational principles that have applied to organ transplantation from its infancy. And, those, and that 
ethical underpinning basically starts with the condition that the organ donation in itself is not a cause of death for the donor and that donation does not cause pain to the donor. We call that the dead donor rule. So, how, so if we're going to have dead donors, how do we define death? The most historic way that we've defined death is circulatory arrest or circulatory irreversible cessation of cardiac function. In the late 1960s, Harvard Medical School in 1968 proposed the concept of brain death. And because that has allowed um, the least ischemic time for our, for our uh, organs that we are able to then uh, procure for transplantation, as well as some of the emotional and ethical underpinnings, that has become the most common mechanism by which we um, have successful organ donation. However, because of this widening gap of patients awaiting uh, transplantation and those patients that are willing to be donors, we have tried to now go back to um, an, what's an old concept. So, D, so DCD is certainly not a new concept. Um, and early on, because of the prolonged ischemia, um, kidneys were really the organs that were able to be um, harvested or procured, um, and and the concept of donation after cardiac death has really evolved from non heart beating donor then to donation after cardiac death, and now our new uh, way of defining this is donation after circulatory determination of death, or CCDD. Um, so as you can see from this. Uh, Donation after circulatory death has, is not a new concept. And early on, it was mostly cadaveric kidneys and livers, uh, but they did not have the best outcomes because of the prolonged ischemia. Uh, now that we have improved techniques and better preservation, uh, we are now able to uh, procure kidneys, livers, pancreas, lungs, and now occasionally even hearts. Uh, and of course, there's always tissue uh, donation that comes that comes with it. So, the other uh, statistic that's remarkable is less than one percent of hospital deaths are actually brain deaths, and ninety percent of patients that die in an ICU setting die so from limitation of treatment or withdrawal of life support. So, this is our biggest pool of untapped potential donors. And more specifically in the pediatric population, um, most kids that die in the hospital die in an ICU setting, either in the neonatal intensive care unit or the pediatric intensive care unit. Now, PICU mortality rates are generally in the 3 to 4% of all, of all admissions to the ICU. Only about 10% of those patients meet brain death criteria. 70% of those patients die from withdrawal of life sustaining treatment. Now, that is a tremendous pool of donation, but only less than 1% of all pediatric ICU patients become organ donors. Also, as and most of those patients are from uh, meeting brain death criteria. Now, the number of patients dying from brain death has also continued to decrease as our resuscitation and medical management techniques have improved over the past 20 years. So, what are the underpinnings and guidelines that have tried to expand this potential donor pool? So, in, 19, in the mid 90s, the Institute of Medicine came out with a, a policy statement saying that donation after cardiac death was safe ethically acceptable and medically useful a method to increase available organs. They reaffirmed that in 2000 and 2005, and Joint Commission actually mandated that every hospital needed to have a donation after cardiac death protocol in 2007. And the initial studies 
uh, seem to imply that we could increase our potential organ donors by 20 to 25 percent, which would have a tremendous impact of this gap between the patients that are awaiting transplant and and the organs that we're able to actually um, transplant. And there have been policy statements uh, from the Institutes of Medicine, the American College of uh, Critical Care Medicine, Society for Critical Care Medicine, the American Academy of Pediatrics, that have all endorsed the practice and reaffirmed the ethical uh, underpinnings of DCPD. However, there have been several surveys that have shown that there are ethical concerns in for neurologists, perioperative personnel, pediatric ICU physicians, mm -hmm. multidisciplinary teams, including ICU nurses, ICU respiratory therapists, as well as the general public. So how do we guarantee that we make sh that we keep these conflicts of interest and these in ethical concerns in perspective? First, we have to acknowledge that there is inherently a conflict of interest um, between the needs of a potential patient that is approaching end of life and the needs of a donor. And the transplant should, potential for organ donation should always be approached with the interest of the potential donor kept at the heart of our discussion. We should, and if we if we keep the focus on the patient and the family as they approach the end of life, and able to allow them to approach those decisions with some dignity and some grace, then we are able to address the issues of the hospital staff and the OPO staff that are dealing with this difficult condition, and as well as improve the outcome for potential recipients of these organs and help society in terms of allowing more patients to have uh, a healthier life. So the ethical uh, concepts that we're going to talk about a little bit more in detail are autonomy, uh, which is the, light of, the right of self-determination, non-malfeasance, which talks about not doing harm to the patient, beneficence, which is about in trying to do the best by that of patient, uh, as well as justice. So autonomy and informed consent, um, children lack the capacity for self-determination. They are ethically and legally incapable of providing informed consent in our society. Some, pa some children might be developmentally able to provide assent, but oftentimes if we're discussing donation after circulatory determination of death, they are in not in a clinically, it, they're not clinically not in a state that they can um, uh, provide such assent. And so we rely often on a surrogate decision maker, oftentimes it is the parent. Um, the one caveat in having a surrogate decision maker is we often rely on that surrogate decision maker to do what's in the best interest of the patient. There have been a few um, dissenters in the overwhelming ethical, uh, the positive reviews of, of the ethics of DCDD in that doing an altruistic act to help somebody else inherently does not benefit the patient that dies. So some have questioned whether altruism should be an, a reasonable expectation uh, for being able to consent or assent uh, for transplantation on behalf of someone else. So non-malfeasance is the uh, again, goes back to that dead donor, dead donor role. Um, if, and we have some, some issues here as well. If a physician declares a patient uh, inappropriately early as, as having passed, um, this could cause the act of organ recovery to be the cause of death. And we'd never want to have 
um, that happen. If, and also, if, the, if we're too cautious and declare the patient too late, then it increases the, the degree of organ ischemia and undermines the, the recipient of, the, of this potential organ, which would then um, get into difficulty with the concept of beneficence and justice. So, what, so in order to um, ensure that a patient has died and died in a timely fashion, uh, there's another concept. There, there have been some case studies of uh, concept of autoresuscitation. Typically, these are patients that are actively being resuscitated, so have a high circulating uh, catecholamine uh, load, and so there has been spontaneous resumption of circulation after resuscitation efforts have stopped. So because of this, we always have a time delay of two to five minutes in which we have a second exam to ensure that the patient truly has died. Um, and part of the way that we have addressed this as a community is really working on our language. So we've gone from non heart beating donor to donation after cardiac death, which implied that there was an irreversible cessation of cardiac function. But we know that these patients that we, which were withdrawing life support, that if we actively resuscitate them, that we could potentially bring their cardiac function back. So in, in this case, we're trying to uh, allow that patient to die in peace in a natural way. And so we've now changed our terminology to, to be more understanding of that. Um, to say that this is donation after circulatory determination of death. So just to highlight uh, some of these concepts of non-malfeasance and beneficence, I asked actually on a pediatric ICU listserv um, how people felt about the concept of donation after cardio uh, circulatory determination of death. And one of uh, my colleagues, a pediatric ICU physician in Arizona, wrote back that it feels like uh, quote, it feels like I'm killing one patient by extubating them in order to be able to help other patients with organ donation. And in that sense, it's the framing of that discussion and how we talk about what we're doing is very important. Um, skip this. So, So how do we make sure that we do right by that patient? We want to make sure that we never allow a patient to die. So the language that we use around this is very important. So we have a patient who is terminally ill in which we decide to withdraw life support because that is the right thing to do for that patient. Once that patient has passed, if the family chooses, if, that, if it is within the desire of that family to be able to help others, we want to do that withdrawal of life support in a place that would facilitate organ recovery. But the, the language we use to describe this really um, go back to sort of these ethical underpinnings, and that's why we have to be cautious how we, about how we talk about certain things. Um, so how do we protect the, the potential donor? We first make sure that the team that's taking care of that patient is never part of the transplant team, that we keep them as two discrete silos. And the, the decision to end and withdraw care is always a decision that's made prior to any request or decision for organ donation. So how do we actually do DCDD once the family has decided that they're going to uh, make that, attempt to make that gift? Is we make sure that we do this in a setting that, so that we minimize the time of potential ischemia to organs. That when we do declare death that we have a, a two to five minute delay depending on the protocol that we're following. Um, to ensure that there is no auto-resuscitation. And 
the, if the patient is able to, um, to pass in a 60 to 120 minute period, then they would be a candidate for donation, but the family needs to understand that if they survive longer than that, that they would not be a candidate for donation. Um, the good news is that despite all of these ethical questions, our um, numbers have really gone up. Um, in 2015, we, uh, there were a total of 9,000 donors, and almost 1,500 of them, or 16.5%, were from DCDD donors. Um, and our hope is that eventually the DCDD will account for up to 20 to 25 percent of all uh, organ donations. So in pediatrics particularly, there, there has been uh, significant barriers to implementation. Part of that is uh, the ICU staff becomes very emotionally invested with the patient families and we have strong bonds. And so, um, there's worry that there will be a negative in, uh, impact on the experience of withdrawal of life support and end of life care if this is done in a foreign environment is in the operating room. Um, there's a definite emotional burden on the process uh, on healthcare providers as well as OPO staff. Uh, and then there are ethical and emotional issues in obtaining consent for families. This has resulted in significant variation in existing pediatric DCDD protocols across the country and in their implementation in utilities. Um, the, I, we have to honor that the ICU staff has often, because they have so much experience in, in shepherding families through the end of life, that they often have an institutionalized, mechanized, and managed system in which to uh, support families as well as the staff. And that when the patient is taken to the operating room, um, for um, procurement that, or for withdrawal of life support that the ICU uh, team maintains um, control of the emotional support of the family as well as the staff. So there's still barriers to expanding uh, donation after circulatory determination of death. The most frequent reason that we have donor ineligibility is non-referral. So, if we build better collaborative teams, um, our hope is that we'll have better referrals and that we can improve our potential donor pool. Um, and that the act of donation is actually a benefit to families um, because they feel uh, that they've been able to help others uh, and give meaning to this uh, um, very difficult prospect of losing a child. So this is a very typical case. I'm just going to go over it very quickly because it sort of highlights some of these issues. Uh, Parker was a three-year-old uh, little boy who was playing in the backyard during a barbecue party. Uh, grandma was supposed to be watching him and she took her eye off of him for just a second, she says. Um, but then when they went to look for him, they found him uh, at the bottom of a swimming pool. Downtime was probably around 10 minutes. Uh, when EMS arrived, he did not have uh, a heart rate, but they began in it, uh, initiated a CPR and was, were able to get a heart rate back before he came to the emergency room. Um, the OPO was contacted early because the patient met criteria and had a GCS with less than 3T. Uh, and the family, the mom that was at the bedside uh, had a family member or friend who had received, uh, had been a recipient of a transplanted organ and was very much pro-donation. But the family service coordinator that came uh, painted a graver picture to the family and was out of sync for where the family was and where the, where the ICU staff was at that time. And mom felt that there was a high pressure sales pitch uh, and the child was initially consented for DCD. D, although the mom felt very uncomfortable with that. Uh, she rescinded that, uh, that consent. And, however, the child did progress to brain death after a couple of more days, and the child was able to be a, a organ donor with a brain death policy. So the concerns that this particular case has uh, 
raised in terms of family issues, uh, are, there was a tremendous amount of guilt and angst in the family of losing a three-year-old boy, her only child. The biological father was, was not present because he happened to be incarcerated at the time. And luckily, we were able to work with um, our social services, and the dad was able to visit him before he passed. Um, and many, many families uh, quote, still have hope until uh, they're able to really process the information that's being given to them. So uh, being able to sit with families makes a big difference in their acceptance of this process. Um, the staff also had issues. They did not feel included in um, where the family service coordinator was, and so they were off, out of sync and couldn't support uh, the family during this. Uh, and the expectations of the hospital staff were not uh, consumerate with what the OPO was able to provide. You know, the hospital staff initially thought that the, the first interaction would just really be an introduction and not a full court press for consent. And so because we were out of sync, we weren't able to have a easy first conversation. And so this case highlights a very typical uh, opioid referral. And so we wanted to go over a case that um, really highlighted some of the good things that can happen when we have a team effort and a collaborative approach. So I'm going to hand this over to Kristen. So I'm going to review a case out of Summerlin Hospital here in Las Vegas, Nevada. This hospital is a 400-bed community hospital with a pediatric intensive care unit. The hospital at this time had had only six donors in the last three years, and one had been a DCD. The initial referral was placed by PICU staff on December 25th, 2016 at 10 a.m. Clinical triggers had been met on the 25th upon admission. Uh, this patient presented as a GCS of three, vented with a suspected neural injury, and had been transferred from another community hospital for a higher level of care. In review of clinical course of this patient, the patient is an 11-year-old male with a past medical history of asthma and vocal cord dysfunction, admitted status post-cardiac arrest with anoxic brain injury with 90 minutes of downtime per the electronic medical record. The patient is without reflexes and is appearing clinically brain dead upon the initial referral to the, to the OPO. The organ procurement organization was on site um, in the AM for referral follow-up and was informed by the bedside nurse that a CBF would be ordered by the intensivist as the family was hopeful and the intensivist felt that the family needed to see imaging. Uh, cerebral blood flow was ordered, showed no blood flow, um, and the patient at that time um, had appeared to be with a posturing reflex per the intensivist on the unit. The Organ Procurement Organization, Nevada Donor Network, followed the case closely, and we were made aware of cerebral blood flow results. Uh, the in-house clinical coordinator, myself, placed a call to the pediatric intensive care unit and discussed the plan for discussing CBS results with family. The PICU intensivist requested that Nevada Donor Network Nevada uh, staff be present for possible integration post results of the CBF um, during a family meeting. A family conference was held later on that evening with the parents, the PICU intensivists, um, as well as the unit manager, the pediatric clinical nurse specialist, alongside with the um, bedside nurse. Uh, I think it was imperative that every player um, was present for discussion with the family. NDN Family Services Coordinator was asked to speak to family post results in regards to donation as an end-of-life option. <clears throat> 
Discussion of DCD donation versus brain death donation was had with the family. The family was undecided at that time and wanted to reconvene in the morning and have further discussion with the organ procurement organization. There was a plan put in place to meet in the AM for further decision making. Um, a call was received within hours of this conversation and mom stated to the bedside nurse that she wanted to move forward with donation through the DCD pathway and that she'd like an OR to be completed within 48 hours. So after conversation with the OPO staff, the mom had spoken to the patient's siblings. Of note, this patient was a triplet. Um, his siblings had stated that if their brother could save a life, that that's what he would want. On the morning of the 28th, we are again on site for the start of this case. An OR at this time is unavailable. Uh, procuring physician unavailable as well due to holiday staffing and an extubation is then pushed to the following day in the evening. The family um, is met with the OPO and hospital staff. There's a family meeting as the patient is appearing areflexic um, to discuss the option for brain death testing and additional organ placement. Um, this was a collaborative meeting that the OPO and the hospital staff along with the family took place um, in the unit um, and I think was essential to how well um, and how smooth things moved throughout the course um, of this case. The decision was made by the parents to keep a PM extubation and to proceed as a DCD. Uh, the patient's father was agreeable to proceed with brain death testing as he stated he wanted more time, but the mother of the patient stated to those in the family conference that she just wanted this all to be over with. And so hearing that, it was very important that we all listened as a team um, to what the needs of this family was and to proceed with their needs and wishes. The patient was transferred to the PACU for terminal extubation along with family, Nevada Donor Network staff, the pediatric intensivist, two PICU RNs, as well as the clinical nurse specialist. The patient was extubated in the PACU and death was declared 17 minutes post extubation. It was important to the PICU staff that the nurses who cared for this child be present for his extubation the nurses felt their presence was needed for the family and the OPO supported their needs. Education on the process of a DCD extubation was had several times so that staff could familiarize themselves with what to expect. Some hurdles and ethical considerations brought forward with this case included integration of NDN Family Services Coordinator and when the timing of that integration would take place, um, inclusion of the OPO in conversation with the family, um, as well as scheduling an OR and allocation of organs. This is, a, as I said previously, a community hospital with very few donors. Um, we had holiday hours that we were competing with, an OR that was unavailable due to staffing, um, and then an OR that had to be pushed past our 48-hour request time. Um, we also had conversation with parents in, regarding, uh, in regards to maximizing the gift and whether or not we should proceed with the brain death declaration versus DCD donation, and it was very clear um, with wishes of mom and having conversation with dad that DCD donation was the route that was best suited for this family. Again, DCD versus brain death education. Um, the PICU staff was very unfamiliar with DCD donation and um, in every encounter throughout the hospital, um, from setting an OR to informing administration of a new case, DCD education was given. Uh, time constraints secondary to the holiday and OR availability as well as time constraints from the family. Some successes, um, huge collaboration um, between the hospital and the organ procurement organization 
the nurses felt vested in the process, and because of that, we have lasting relationships with both the intensivist who was on this case as well as the nurses who are caring for um, this patient throughout his stay. Of course, life from tragedy and two lives were saved. Um, the case debrief um, was held on the PICU unit one week later to discuss dynamics of this case. Involved in that debrief was the PICU intensivist, Dr. Kesavulu, the Oregon Procurement Organization staff, along with hospital staff. In debriefing with staff involved in the case, nurses expressed their gratitude for being a part of something so special. Um, in adult ICU versus pediatric cases, the culture of nurses differs. Families in the PICU setting stay throughout the case, and nurses are intimately connected to these patients. I felt that it was very important that the nurses um, be supported um, and that their senior leadership um, be supported throughout the process. Um, and this was apparent um, in the fact that the nurse manager and the clinical nurse specialist stayed throughout the entire case and were even present for this patient's extubation um, to support their staff. Um, the hospital needed to feel um, just a, a great um, amount of support throughout the entire process to be able to provide support to this family. So as we supported them, they were then able to pass on that support to the family. And um, in doing this, we realized that donation is just as important to our hospital staff and to our families as it is to our recipients. And now we will have Ray um, discuss uh, family dynamics. Thank you so much, Kristen. <clears throat> I want to go through the understanding of family dynamics, some of the ethical concerns in regards to families, and explaining the situations and roles that we all play uh, during uh, these types of donors, or even uh, those that are brain dead donors as well. Um, as Kristen stated earlier, there was uh, a father and a mother. The mother, of course, the parents are actually divorced parents. Mother, who basically was holding primary custody um, and was very vocal um, and very um, um, making sure that uh, the father was not inclusive of most of the discussions as, as, as noted um, that he was not part of the child's life most of the time. Uh, as Kristen stated earlier, the patient is actually one of a set of triplets. Uh, there were two 11-year-old sisters who um, were the ones who stated that if donation was possible, that this is what their brother would have wanted. There was also a 17-year-old sister and a 7-year-old who was not much at the hospital, but did play a role in the very beginning of, of this discussion. Um, as we spoke about earlier, the mother was wanting to make all decisions and want, was wanting everything to go through her. The father, uh, as we all know, was not in the picture, and uh, he challenged some of the decisions that the mother was making. Uh, we knew that there was some history there. Uh, we, we knew that the father was not ready to give up. He, he continued to feel that he needed to give his son a little bit more time. And as a team, and when I talk about a team, I'm talking about what we as an OPO call ourselves a tripod team, which consists of a hospital services team member, and in this case, it was an in-house clinical coordinator, an FSC team member, which of course was a family services coordinator present, as well as an organ team member, which also includes a procurement transplant coordinator and a surgical recovery coordinator. Um, so hence the tripod team, as well as our hospital staff. And when I mention hospital staff, I mention the physician or the intensivist, the bedside nurse, as well as the entire unit uh, who plays a vital role in this process as well. We're talking about our OR staff, chaplain services, as well as child life specialists. We wanted to make sure that we continued support for both families and made sure that they both had a clear understanding of the situation. We allowed them both to take control in situations that we felt they needed to. 
We also uh, became mediator, mediators at a certain point throughout the discussion uh, with this family. Now, as we talked about earlier, the mother of the patient wanted uh, uh, a different FSC because she felt almost as the previous FSC that was there who presented to her was more so um, reading a script. Um, now, now, please keep in mind the FSC that we sent out there, there was only two on that day, myself and someone else, um, was new to uh, the field. Uh, she was put into a situation where uh, she was not only had a group of family members, she also had um, the nursing staff president, a physician present, and, and her, she was actually going through um, nursing school as well. Um, as we all know, for those of us who've been in the field for quite some time or beginning, we always think about who the best person is uh, to be put in, in a situation such as this. Um, and as a team, we huddled to make sure that we had the right person available for this family after the mother brought up this discussion. Uh, the mother also wanted to move forward with extubation and DCD. Um, as she spent a lot of time trying to convince the father to withdraw support on this patient, on her son rather, I should say, that um, she understood that he was not going to come back out of this and that she had already given enough time for him if he was going to come back that he, was going, that he should have already uh, done that. Once again, as a team, we huddled to discuss the plan of action and we all agreed that the father needed to understand the situation and we allowed him to ask the questions that were necessary. We allowed the mother and father to have an open and honest discussion with the team present. Uh, one of the things that uh, we brought up and that Kristen brought up earlier was that we knew the child was brain dead and therefore, um, even though the mother wanted to move forward with withdrawal of life support and continue the path of DCD, uh, that uh, the father would hold on to hope if given more time. And that's exactly what happened during this discussion, but we allowed them to have the exchange that needed to happen, and when the time was right, we had to pull them both back to remember this was about their son and not what happened previously in their lives. Uh, the mother, mother and father had very specific um, uh, time frames, as Kristen talked about earlier, the 48 hours which we did run into some huddles uh, that we had to keep the family updated. They were very cordial in helping and understanding that extended times were needed. Uh, once again, we held those, those team huddles between all of us to make sure that all time frames were um, specifically met. Um, I do want to talk about family. And one of the things uh, that I do as a family services coordinator for the last uh, 17 years is I really truly look at uh, uh, the makeup of a family. And when I talk about the makeup of a family, I talk about the family of origin. As we all know, this is the family that we grew up with, those that are around us, those that um, um, are our parents, those that are our siblings, our aunts and uncles. And then we have our family of choice, the family that we select in our adulthood. For example, if we go over um, to college, we then adopt um, college friends to become part of our family and sometimes become the family of origin. And then I really sit down and look at who the real family is uh, in this situation, who is in and who is really out. The one thing I always remember uh, is that we aren't always absolutely clear about who is family, even in our own families. The composition of family keeps changing and the minds of family members as conditions change losses occur, and additions to our families occur. This is really important to the entire process as we sat together as a team to make sure that we were directing conversations to the family that was needing to hear the information, and that was the family of origin. We also did one of the biggest things that was so important to them is allowing rituals, what we call um, having a prayer service, um, making sure that child life specialist is available to answer and help uh, these children through the process of losing their brother. Um, and one of the things that was requested was the child's favorite song being played during extubation, which uh, was really, really important to this family. 
uh, not necessarily accepting the loss, but actually accepting that their child could possibly, in the end, could help another child. There are two boards that we focus on um, as family services coordinators, and we want to make sure that um, the clinicians that we work with understand this as well. Two words that I really truly focus on is the word ambiguity, and that's the doubtfulness or the uncertainty of the meaning or the intention. And to speak with ambiguity and, and an ambiguity of a manner, and which means sometimes as family services coordinators, which we found out previously prior to the switch out, was that our the family felt that they were not getting clear information, that some of the stuff that was shared was not um, was indefinite, and that the expression and the meaning behind what was saying was not felt. So that was really important that uh, we had uh, to understand that pushes us into the ambiguous loss. That's the unresolved grief that, we occur that occurs when there is no verification of a person's status. And when I talk about status, it's about where the patient is at clinically. And when we as a team sit down together and discuss the process, uh, and we are all on the same page that we can provide these families with the appropriate verbiage, verbiage I'm sorry, and information so that they're able to understand clearly what is happening. But it's also a status of alive or, or being dead as well. One of the things that we need to, to remember, and I include, include ourselves in the clinician um, aspect, is that we need to realize by sharing knowledge that they are empowering families to take control of their situations even when ambiguity exists. So we've, we've gone over a lot of different concepts and I just wanted to give you a few um, take home points. You know, ethically there will be conflicts but we need to make sure that we are very clear about our roles and decouple the process of allowing a patient to pass with dignity when their life does not have any um, chance of meaningful. Um. So um, we know that having trained OPO personnel as well as bedside staff working with families as we navigate this difficult time really does improve uh, outcomes and increases the chance of consent. Um, so what, what can we learn from this? We need to have adequate education and education at all levels. Um, there should be, um, and with adequate education, we know from a uh, study from Children's Hospital Philadelphia that there was no difference in perception of DCDD death versus traditional brain death protocol. Um, the, the staff at the, at the ICU felt that they both could proceed with no, dif with no, with no uh, inherent difficulty. Um, and the main concept that allowed this program to uh, function well is cooperation, acceptance, and commitment. So, The language that we talk about and we go through in terms of t approaching families and approaching each other is very important to having good outcomes. And the better that we do with our communication, the more lives that we can save. So the overarching goal of neonatal and pediatric organ donation and transplantation is to maximize the benefits to donors and recipients without causing harm or violating autonomy. The medical community can approach this goal by providing families of dying children the opportunity to donate without an actual or perceived conflict of interest between the potential donor and the recipient. And we can minimize the harm to the donor with the application of firm criteria either for neurologic death or for circulatory criteria for, for death prior to organ recovery. Um, and systems should be in place to ensure that we have timely referrals, we need to empower trained individuals and OPOs to have these family discussions. And we need appropriately allocate organs based on uh, donor-specific and recipient-specific factors. And we need to be able to speak clearly to families 
that we have to that we know what we're doing and that we can support them through this process. Thank you very much for this opportunity to talk to you. And if you have any questions, uh, I'll turn this over to Dustin. Thank you, Dr. Kesavalu and um, Kristen and Ray for a very thorough presentation and for some very interesting case cases here. Uh, just before I turn it to Dustin for moderating the questions, as a reminder for those of you who are listening in, we are recording so the lines remain closed. For you to submit questions on the bottom left-hand corner, click on that chat icon and type in your question. And then while we have the Q&A time going on, I will have this poll up. For those of you who are listening in a group, please be so kind to submit how many people are in your group today. Um, and I will turn it back to Dustin to uh, begin with the Q&A time. All right, Haiti. Um, why don't we just go ahead and get started? I don't see any questions in the QA right now. So, um, well, I have a quick question for Dr. Kesavulu. Actually, you mentioned a listserv and another physician who actually felt uncomfortable that she was felt like she was killing a patient. Oh, nope. There they go. Um, Dustin, go go ahead and finish your question, and then you. Can yes. Ask. Yes. Um, so you felt this one physician felt like that she was killing a patient. So from your perspective, what is the best verbiage to use in education for us to help get physicians, especially pediatric physicians, over this hurdle? It's not just physicians, but also the people that are actually uh, doing the procedure. In the adult world, I've seen this in... Uh, the respiratory therapist who's asked to physically remove the breathing tube, um, it's often the physicians and the rest of the medical staff that have the conversations with the families and you're asking someone to come in and mechanically um, do something. I think it's really about how we frame the story and how we talk about it. We're talking, and if we keep the focus on the patient and what is right for that child and for the family surrounding that child, uh, then it leads to the rest of the story falling into place in a way that makes sense. So we need to make this about what's right for that patient. If that patient's going to have any sense of a meaningful recovery, then we are, continue to have hope and we push forward with aggressive treatment. But in every case, we need to talk about what is um, life-limiting conditions and what, when it does come time that the child we know or the patient is, is not going to have a meaningful recovery and it's time to withdraw support, then um, we would withdraw that support. And if the patient is able to do, make a gift at that time, then you do it in a way that, make, that facilitates that, but that is not the focus. Thank you very much, Dr. Kesavulu. I see we have a question from Jerm Jeremy Hendrickson. Kristen? Why don't you go ahead and answer this? Was the patient actually declared? No, this patient um, was not declared. Um, conversation was had as a group. Um, this was um, after the fact uh, that the, the family had already discussed DCD donation. The patient was appearing um, at that time that DCD discussion was had with um, reflexes um, and then lost those reflexes. And um, so we um, had discussion with the family. Uh, the organ procurement organization was included in that discussion along with Dr. Kesavulu, and um, we discussed proceeding with brain death declaration. And, um, you know, family uh, had stated very clearly to the entire team that that was not what they wanted to do and that they would um, like to proceed with DCD donation. Mom was just not able to um, add any more days on to this process and very much so wanted things to be wrapped up. And so we honored that discussion and we honored that choice and as a team we moved forward with DCD donation. Thank you so much, Kristen. We actually have a two-part question from Shannon Horton. First part is, I'm wondering why the option was given to pronounce brain death versus DCD. And the second part is, 
What is the youngest smallest DC, DCD donor you have successfully recovered from? So DCD can be done in uh, young children as young as neonates. Uh, however, uh, in our facility, we've only been able, our uh, youngest was the 11-year-old. Um, and in this case, we, opt we gave the option of brain death uh, uh, pronouncement versus DCD because um, the mom was really interested in donation and she had met, and uh, there was some conversation with other family members about what organs could be procured and, and the timing of uh, their procurement. And so we had that conversation. So, um, Dustin, I'm going to jump in real quick here because we are um, just a minute past the hour. Um, and I don't see um, any further questions in the queue right now. So out of respect for everybody's time for today, I want to thank all of the speakers, especially for your time and for preparing this um, very detailed presentation. Thank you so much for all of that information and for sharing this case. It always helps to have cases that it can be related to. And uh, thank you for all of those who spent time with us today participating and learning together. And we wish everybody a wonderful rest of the week. Thank you all and take care.